In the following video, I want to give you a little overview over the new tracking tools in Blender. It's not going to be uh, a tutorial on the complete camera tracking workflow because I assume that of course you already got my tracking DVD from the Blender Foundation. If you don't, now this would still be a good time to get it because um, the changes that we now have Blender 2.64 to the tracking tools are not that big. I mean, if you want to solve a shot or uh, camera tracking or object tracking, um, the solving and everything that you need to know, this is still the same. So the only thing that, that is new are some actual tracking features like planar tracking or uh, location and scale tracking, but the rest is still the same. So all the knowledge that you can get from this DVD uh, will still apply to the new version of Blender. So with that said, I want to show you some of the new tracking tools. Um, and maybe I can demonstrate that by using one of the shots from the movie. Um, and the shot that I'm going to show you is this one. So we have a uh, camera track and an object track. So the background, of course, had to be tracked and this hand to apply this uh, object to his hand. And this shot is good to demonstrate you some of the new tracking tools because we had been using this um, tracking device. You, of course, cannot see here, but I'm going to open the shot right now. So this is the shot and Let's go to Blender now. So first I go to the motion tracking interface and then click on open and then go to the folder with the footage, which is here, of course, on your DVD or wherever you download the footage that will be probably different. So the shot that we are using is 7.1b. Then I'm going into the linear HD folder because if you would use the linear 4Ks, that would take forever. And to track this, the linear HDs are really um, Good enough. So open that and then uh, first I think I have to adjust my system settings so that I can squeeze a bit more into my system memory. So instead of 128 megabytes I want to have 10 gigs. So uh, 10 24 times 10. So that should be good enough to keep some of that in my memory. Um, then let's have a look at the shot. So there he is and he's moving and he's looking scared. He's walking into his doom. So um, I think the, 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 the range that we had been using the, in the movie is from frame 100 or something up to here. Maybe let's just use 250 up to 500. So S for start frame and then go to frame one, uh, 500, press E for end frame, zoom in and then shift left arrow and then alt A to, uh, to play back and to cache everything into the RAM. So this shot was a little bit difficult, uh, not only in terms of tracking, but especially for keying and roto, this was quite horrible because the green screen is really dark and it's not very even because it's, very, it's a huge area in the background. Um, then we have these things in the background standing, these uh, microphone C stands, then we have a ladder and everything is covered in pink markers. Then we have this super green, super dark green cloth to hide the ladder for the light thing. And yeah, that was a lot of roto work, of course. Uh, poor Roman had to do that. And then we have these markers going in front of his face and everything. It was a nightmare. but. Without all these things and all these markers in the background, it would have been impossible to get a decent camera track. And a good camera track is also important to have a decent object track. And that was, of course, very important. So we were lucky to have all this. I'm currently wondering why I don't have enough memory. This should be totally... Heh. Oh, hmm. Okay, I messed up. Probably <laughs> I should have multiplied this instead of just added. So 1024 times 10, of course. So this should now be good enough. Sorry for messing this up. Now we have to wait for a little longer, but of course I can skip that. So um, I will stop the screencast. Okay, so this is now all in the memory and we can play back smoothly. So what are the changes? So first of all, you can still control left click to add a marker, just like before. But then if you zoom in onto this marker, then you see that the 
the interface of the marker has changed a little bit. So before we had this little triangle in the corner and um, a square up here to, to move the pattern area. Now we have this thing, this handle, and you can grab that and then rotate and scale that as, at the same time. So that's very handy. Then you have these four corners. So if you want to change the shape of the pattern area, which can be uh, handy later for a planar tracking or perspective tracking, then you can do that just by left clicking and dragging. And then if we have a look at the search area by clicking here or pressing Alt S, um, then you see the search area still has this triangle and everything. But now if we uh, click here and grow the pattern area, then as soon as we touch the border of the search area, we can also um, make this grow. So this is very handy if you want to adjust the size quickly. So just one little push and it will grow. And then if you have that, you can still press Ctrl T to track that. At least in theory, I can't for some reason. Ah, I know. Ah, this is the my typical Mac problem, so I cannot press Ctrl T. Um, I have to do this, unfortunately. But we can see it still tracks nicely. We press L to lock that to the feature, and this is just perfect. So that's very nice. Um, so what's the difference apart from the interface? Well, in the old tracking system, we had different tracking algorithms like hybrid, KLT, and SAD. Um, now we don't have them anymore. And that's not a problem because the new stuff that we have is much better. So now we have the Ceres solver to calculate all the tracking stuff. And that is one library from Google, actually. Uh, by the way, here in the background somewhere, this is the developer. This is Kier Mierle, and he was also playing one of the scientists in our shots. And so he has been coding all the tracking in Blender, or at least he has been coding uh, libmv and this Cirrus library. Uh, the tracking interface and the Blender part was done by Sergei Sharibin. So the new stuff that we have, the Cirrus solving, also allows to use different motion models. So if you have a look in the tracking settings, now you, there is not KLT and SAD anymore. Now you have different motion models and you can choose between six different models. So you can only track the location. You can track the location and rotation, location and scale, log rod scale, affine and perspective. So the location model is basically more or less the same as we had before. So it was only tracking the point in the 2D space of this object. And then of course, if you change to rotation and location, it will also try to track that. So if we maybe align this with the stick, I don't even know if that is really necessary, but if we align that and then set the tracking settings over here, which also relate to the active tracker, uh, to the active marker, sorry. And if you track that now, now it also rotates. But I have to say for Mango, for all the tracking, I didn't really use the rotation mode. The other thing that was extremely helpful, unfortunately, when I had to do this shot, I didn't have that yet. So this shot in movie has been tracked with the old tracking system. Uh, and that was very annoying because as you can see here, these balls, these ping pong balls, um, are changing their size because the camera is uh, further away than he is moving. So it would be kind of nice if the markers would actually adjust to the feature that they are tracking. So if I place a marker here with the usual settings, um, scale it up a little bit and then track that, then it's tracking fine. But then uh, the feature is getting smaller, but the marker doesn't adjust. That is not such a big problem in this case, but you can see how the marker is now sliding off the center. So again, it's not a big deal, but it is not really that accurate. And here it's just losing it completely. So maybe it helps if we uh, make it so that the marker is actually adjusting to the size of the feature. Now, if I show you that, there might be a different problem, and that is that there is also uh, changes in the lighting. 
but let's see what happens. So if I set the motion model to location and scale and now track that, then and you can see how it is adjusting to the size. The problem in this case is that the size is also being influenced, or the size that the marker is thinking it is tracking is also influenced by the lighting. So here it's a bit weird. But again, if I keep on tracking, it will adjust the size of this uh, white ping pong ball, and that is better than before. Although in this case, it's also really going uh, crazy. Now, the other problem is that, as you can see here, there are changes in the lighting. And you can fix that or try to fix that by enabling normalize. So if you're using the normalize setting, then Blender will not look at the, well, I can't really describe it. It will try to normalize the contrast so that changes in the overall lighting do not really affect the trackability. Now that also doesn't really help uh, in every case, but if there are changes in the lighting, then you should try to use that. In other cases, if there is even lighting, then the normalized setting might be uh, might confuse the marker, uh, the, the tracker. So it's not the uh, recommended default setting. But if there are light changes, then it can really help. So let's see how this is performing now. So it seems as if it would be sticking to the center much better. And then also here, yeah, this is way better now, especially because the marker is also adjusting the size. So if you look at that, this is now tracking really, really nicely. So especially if you have balls, ping pong balls for motion tracking like this, then the location and scale setting can be very handy. Then there is uh, another setting that can be very helpful, and that is pre-pass. So if you remember the old tracking system, then you had the hybrid tracker, and that was also using a very uh, similar model. So this is, if you look at the tooltip, this is using a brute force translation, only pre-track, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this brute force calculations can really help if you have difficult tracks. Now, in this case, they all track fine without any, without any uh, pre-pass, but maybe one of the uh, markers in the background uh, might be tricky to track. So maybe let's first see if we can separate the channels. So just for the display to see them better, I only enable the green channel. And then let's see maybe one of these. Also, to make a track better, we could limit that tracking to the green channel. Now let's see how good or bad this is tracking. We press L to lock it to the center, but well, it's too good. <laughs> it's just tracking fine. Although in this case, now it's stopping. So maybe we can enhance that by using the pre-pass motion model thing. Um, no, unfortunately not. So this also doesn't help. Uh, maybe I can find some example where you would benefit from the uh, pre-pass. So basically, pre-pass would um, use a different algorithm to search within the search area for this pattern. But in this case, they are all too easy to track. So, well, I can't demonstrate that now. But I can tell you that uh, if you use pre-pass, in some cases it will be much better but it will also a lot slower. And this is something that I can definitely demonstrate. So if I enable a pre-pass, then this is now a lot slower than before. Okay, so that is that. But the most amazing thing is the perspective or affine tracking. Um, so when uh, location, rotation, and location and scale are, um, well, trying to adjust to the feature, uh, but not change the shape of the actual marker, then affine and perspective will do that. So for example, if we go back to the start of the sequence, and for example, we want to track his cloth. For example, this thing right here. Maybe let's go back to color display mode. 
So if you do that and just click here and add a marker, maybe make it bigger and then track that, it will do quite well, but then it will stop. So this could be due to lighting changes. So in the tracking settings, let's set this to normalize and add a new marker. Maybe make it a bit bigger. L to lock that. And this is doing pretty well, but still it loses it. So one thing that you can try is to go from keyframe to previous frame. So especially if you're doing object tracking or uh, tracks with lots of changes, then I would recommend to use previous frame. Now track that again and see what's happening. Ah, so this is now a lot better even. But in the end, it's starting to slide. And of course, here it's messing up completely, of course. But here, especially in these last frames, you can see how it's sliding away. And that is mainly because the feature that it is tracking is deforming. So when this is the pattern that is being tracked, so this amount of black and this amount of black, then here, It's basically looking the same, but if you look here in the in the footage, this is not the same spot anymore. And that is because this feature is deforming. So we also should have a deforming marker. And that's where you can use affine in perspective. So let's first try affine tracking. So affine will try to um, stick to that feature, but also will try to um, deform in a way that it is deforming together with the marker, but without using perspective. So the edges here will stay the same length, but they will deform. So I can just demonstrate that. So also um, I'm using keyframe now, which will probably mess up because especially affine and perspective should be used with previous frame matching, but let's see what happens. So you can see how this is deforming and how also the search area is growing and shrinking to try to keep the same distance from these uh, edges. Okay, and now it's messing up. Okay, so this was affine tracking with keyframe. Now let's try and see what happens if we set this to previous frame. Just scale it up like that and then Command T or Control T to track that. Okay, so I think that this was now sticking much better to that feature. So you can see that it is following the deformation of this area and is really sticking much better than the location marker was doing. So this is really a big difference. Now it was kind of slow and one reason is that uh, we still have pre-pass enabled and also the search area was quite big. Now especially with affine and perspective you really don't need that much um, or that big of a search area so you can I think you can even make it much smaller like that. And also pre-pass is not always necessary. Now let's see how that performs now. So it's way faster. It's still quite accurate and it's tracking. Okay, in the end now it messes up. Well, this could be due to the smaller search area. I'm not sure. Okay, the, the general idea is that this is now deforming together with that feature and it's reasonably fast. You don't need to have pre-pass. Normalize will, will still help. And now let's see what happens if we use perspective. So again, same spot. Make this bigger with that. So search area uh, just a little bit bigger, maybe like so, and then control T to track again. And you can see how, well, it's kind of messing up much more than affine was doing but especially in the beginning you can see how it tries to keep the perspective so that means that the edges are growing and shrinking in relation to each other 
So this is a one of the areas or one case where affine is actually better than perspective. So perspective works best if you have um, distinctive features in all the corners. So this is well, it's quite fuzzy here. So that is not really that that good. So let me try to do something else. So maybe that could be a nice corner. This would be a nice corner. And well, this makes it quite big, but still this would be a great corner. So let's see how that is tracking. So far that is quite nice. So this is sticking to these corners much better. Well, this is messing up, of course, because it was leaving the frame. But that is not that big of a problem. So we can go back and hmm, maybe here reset it to that corner. Now we can also make the search area smaller again, like so. Uh, and now it's deforming very nicely with that feature. So I think you get the idea. So this can really be very helpful, especially if you're using, uh, if you're tracking fuzzy things. Uh, I can demonstrate that with the hair even. So if I would try to make um, a head track, an object track for the head, and would have to use, have, would have to track the hair, then I think that Blender might be able to track this, even though it's really quite difficult to track. You can see how it is performing quite nicely with perspective. So this is changing and adjusting to the shape. Well, okay, now here it's messing up. Let's see if we can help it with adjusting the search area. So that is quite nice. And of course, you might wish to be able to use the deforming shapes of that right away for compositing or in the 3D viewport. But well, you can't do that at the moment. So this is really just uh, to generate tracks uh, for camera tracking or even for um, just two point, um, no, for uh, 2D tracks. So to create an empty, for example, in the 3D viewport. Um, but you won't uh, generate uh, deforming shapes like you have here. So for example, planar trackers like Mocha from After Effects can do that. Blender unfortunately cannot do that, but still you are able to track stuff like that and that is quite remarkable and very, very helpful. Even in some cases you can track skin tones. So if you have something like this, eventually a Blender will be able to do something with that. Okay, it's a bit jumpy, but you can see at least something's happening. Okay, so that is planar tracking. And um, basically I think that's it for planar tracking, yeah. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to show you is how to use the mask feature. So for example, if you have this thing right here that you want to track, then if you just place a normal marker here, then you will probably have um, some problems, for example, I'll just play back here. So this marker would go and go behind these dark areas of his head. So maybe I can show you. So instead of using perspective, let's use a normal location model. And also maybe, yeah, normalize prepass. We could enable previous frame is fine. So I place a marker here scale it up so that it fits to that place. I don't do anything with the search area. I just place it here and then track that. Maybe with L so that we can stay centered. So that is doing fine, but then there is so much stuff happening in the background that it gets confused and will stop tracking, even though it is set to previous frame, which could lead to sliding, but often this will still work. But the contrast in the background is so big that this fails.
Okay, so of course you can just reset it manually with G, then continue on tracking, and then there will be another dark area in the background. So here it also fails because there's just too, too much stuff happening. So it would be nice if you could just mask out all the stuff that is going on in the background. And you can do that if you enable the use mask feature. So if you do that, then if you place a marker, and I want to scale it up just like the other one. So S, scale it up just like that. And now you can paint a mask around the stuff that you want to track. So in the grease pencil panel that you can find up here, you have to change from clip to track. And now if you hold down the D key and paint around this area, you can limit the tracked area to everything that is inside this. That will only be used if you have this checkbox enabled, use mask. So in the tracking settings here, use mask is enabled. Uh, if you want to get a better idea of what, what is actually inside the tracked area, I mean, you see, of course, that, but you can visualize that in the track panel with this button here. This is now grayed out. And if I now track that, it's doing just fine because it is not being confused uh, by the stuff that is happening in the background. So that's a very, very useful tool for tracking especially if you have markers that go in front of uh, backgrounds, stuff like that, um, then this can really be very helpful, especially if you have features like this. So also for, for all the ping pong balls, this would have been incredibly helpful, but unfortunately, as I've told you, when I was doing this shot, uh, I didn't have all these tools. Okay, so that is the mask tool. And then finally, um, there are two new interface changes and that is or actually it's three So one thing is previously you could just press the Z key um, to bring up the curve view and I hope I am right that this was the case in 2.63. I cannot even remember um, Well now if you want to go to curve view you have this just like in the sequence You have these extra buttons in the in the header. So now you can switch to curve view for all the tracks or to, and that is also new, the dope sheet. Maybe let's stay for a while at the curve view and I press shift spacebar to go to full screen mode because now we have that here. So in this motion tracking uh, layout preset kind of thing, we have all the curves here. Um, if you want to limit the curve view, because currently it's showing everything, if you want to limit that to only the active or to the selected marker, you can use that button. So now this is only showing everything that is selected. So now it's these two, if you press A, everything will be shown, or you can also disable that button, then you can uh, always see everything. You can still select markers by clicking on these curves there's one little regression, unfortunately, and that is that uh, previously Blender would focus on the active curve. Now that doesn't happen anymore, so you have to zoom out and see which marker is active to be able to focus on that. But, and I'm not sure if that was previously possible, uh, but what you can do is to uh, press the B key for border select, then select these keys inside of the box, and then press um, shift D to disable them. So basically now you have uh, a track with two parts. So all these are now disabled and you can also not enable them anymore. So now they are just gone. Um, yeah, so that is the curve view and you can still filter if you want to see just the camera uh, curve or the track curve. Currently I don't have a camera track here so I cannot show you. The other thing is uh, the dope sheet that you can find over here. You can also switch them from here so it's also possible. But the good thing about the dope sheet is that now this is just a different view how to view your tracks. So you can order them based on the name. So if you have, I mean usually you would probably have just track one, two, three and so on but you can also have like better names. If you have complicated tracks, you might find that helpful. Or you can sort them after the total length or after the longest coherent track. So 
uh, track 0 0.005 would now be the, the one at the bottom. Usually I invert the order and I think that should actually be the default, but I couldn't convince Sergey to change that. So this is what you have. Um, you can order them also if you have a camera track or if you actually do have a object solved or something solved, then you can also um, sort based on the average solve error, which is very helpful. Um, so you can, if you want to see what of which of these tracks is actually messing up your solution, uh, if that is the case, then you can order for average error, invert that, and then you will have the track with the biggest error. You will have that up here. So that is that. And the last change, and that will be also covered in a different chapter, is you have now this interface. Um, so if you want to switch to the mask, you can do that here and then create new masks. So this is now a mask and not uh, a track anymore. But if you want to switch quickly between these uh, interfaces, so previously you, can, you could just press the tab key and then go here. Now it works more like the vertex or face select mode in the 3D viewport. So press tab and then you will have this menu and then you can press tab one for tracking, track, uh, not track, tab and then two to go to the second menu item. So tab two would be reconstruction, tab three distortion, which I rarely use, uh, and then tab four for mask mode. So that's quite nice because now it's more clear which shortcut stands for what mode. And basically, I think these are really all the changes. Ah, it's not true. One of these is also very helpful. Actually, it's two. <laughs> ah, I think I should open up um, a different shot to show you that. Okay, so here's one of the tech head shots. So here he's grabbing his arm gun and then running away. Um, so this would be a very typical case for a tripod shot. And we did have lots of these tripod shots in our movie. Uh, so a lot of them of the, of the tech head, then in the command center, even on the bridge, lots of them are uh, tripod shots. So that means that the camera um, is based on a tripod, so it doesn't really move that much. It's basically just rotating. Or even if it's not rotating, it's just jittering or just very, very subtle camera movements like that. And for this, it would be barely possible to create really a camera 3D solve from that. So basically, yeah, this is not possible. And for a long time, we have been suffering from not being able to do that. And it turns out it was so simple to code that. But anyway, so we, we didn't have it. Now we have it finally. And it's so great to have it because it makes everything so easy. For example, if you have this shot, no, there is not much movement. You, you just need to track three or four markers and then you can solve that. So let's see, we have this thing. And well, unfortunately you can see that the, uh, well, not only does it not track, but the other thing is um, the, the stage that we have here uh, has been kind of wobbly. So he's touching these things. So they are not solid enough, so they are kind of wobbling. Also, I think this thing in the background is a bit wobbly, also the lamp, so we cannot really use them. And what's more, here in the background, the markers are not there. So I, I have put some markers in the background, but they are um, not visible because they are not within this camera view. So I think there are some markers up here and then over there. Anyway, so we have to live with that. As you can see, this marker that I've tracked there, it's going away because he's going through that. But maybe, I mean, we, we can kind of work around that because, I mean, the hair is going through that, but then we can do one thing and that is to press G twice, so double G, to offset the tracking area or the pattern area, but the anchor point for the marker will still be here. So now Alt right click. Now we can continue solving this point even though we are not even tracking that point, but down here. And now that we see this again, G twice again to reset that, then Alt right arrow to continue tracking that. Now he will go in front of that again. So G twice, move that over here, track for a few frames, G twice, then track down here. I mean, this is a really bad hack. This is really cheating. 
but ah, it's kind of working so okay let me offset that over here now we can set that back and it's, this is going quite well so again I want to offset this G twice over here track for a few frames and since the camera is not moving really that much this is really not not a big deal so we can live with that and have a nice continuous 2d track even though there will be lots of errors because as you can see the thing is wobbling as he's running over the stage so instead let's also track something over here because this is a little bit more solid and also i think previous always help and also pre-pass so yeah track that okay now we have the same problem again so g twice to offset then track a few frames over here actually we might just as well continue with that so this is even working and then maybe also track one from here track backwards okay so that's how i track these three markers um, and the nice thing is now that we only really need to have the a uh, little bit of camera rotation and to get that we cannot just press shift s to solve that because you would need eight tracks uh, on the two keyframes because this would would be required to get a 3d solution but instead we can now enable the tripod motion mode and press shift s and we get a solve error that is not great but it's also not too bad i mean the solve error is basically I guess because of this one because it's wobbling so let's see what's happening here oh, we might even have a jump it's probably when I have been resetting them yeah so let's order them by solve error invert so let's see which one is that so interface wise this is still not ideal so I think this could be oh actually this is not oh Hang on. Ah, this is the worst one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What we have here is now a tripod solve mode. And to show you what that is, I go to 3D view. Also open up the properties to go to the camera. Select the camera. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, I forgot to set the camera data. Of course, you would have to do that as well. So, I don't know. Probably it's maybe, f I don't know. 50 maybe so the sensor for the sony f65 was 24.33 and the focal length could be 35 25 or 50 i'm not even sure let's try shift s ah that's better of course so now let's see which one is that um okay now this makes sense now this has the biggest error so that's fine Anyway, now we have the camera solve and it's a decent solve error. So now we can go to the constraints panel and add the camera solver constraint. And you can see that we have these um, three markers in the 3D viewport, but they are not representing any 3D point. This is just the, well, kind of a 2D space. So only the only thing that the camera is doing is rotating. So if in the 3d viewport you enable in the motion tracking the camera path there is no path of course not because the camera is only rotating so the only thing that the camera is doing is rotating around its own axis um, so set this as the background and now this is sticking very nice and that's how we got away with lots of shots so just using tripod solving for these little camera movements was always enough. So that is tripod. Now the other thing is that if you would have a 3D track, uh, then you would have to set the keyframes. This is still very important. So let's say I have um, eight markers tracked. Maybe let's see how fast I can do that. No, I think I don't need to do that. Anyway, for uh, for a camera solve, you would have to have eight markers. And then the most important thing are the keyframes. And why that is so important is explained on that DVD that I've been talking about. 
And if you want to support the Blender Foundation, please get the DVD. Um, so the thing is, uh, it can be it can make a difference of the solve error of 0 0.4 and 2 million uh, offsetting one of the keyframes for one frame. Especially if you have object tracks or difficult uh, camera motions, then the keyframes are really the most important thing that you can do. Uh, so you always have to see where the most perspective shift is. And in that case, you have to set, for example, keyframe A to frame 66, then keyframe B to frame to, for example, 126. So and, and then if that didn't work, then you have to go here again and reset the keyframe or drag them. And that can be very annoying, especially if you have to use the timeline to uh, to see where the most perspe uh, perspective is. So your uh, cursor is already on the right spot. So what you can do now is to just use a hotkey. And the hotkeys for setting the keyframes are Q and E, which is very handy because your left hand is already there on that spot on your keyboard. So you can just press Q and E. So Q would be keyframe A. So watch that, Q. And now, uh, where could it be? Maybe here. And then I press E for the second keyframe. And that's how you can really quickly try different solving modes. So if I would have eight markers now, I could try to solve, shift S, aha, uh -huh, it doesn't work. So press E again to uh, set the keyframe. And yeah, that's very handy. So, and I think that these were really all the changes to the Blender tracking module. So I hope this could give you a little overview and now have fun tracking.